despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. Despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. And someone will say his career can never be saved. Despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. Hey guys, welcome to another installment of Just Nicolas Cage, the show where I very, very slowly work through Nicolas Cage's filmography. Today I'm talking about the 1990 cult classic Wild at Heart. So in Wild at Heart, Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern are madly in love with each other, but Laura Dern's mother doesn't approve. And when Cage gets out of jail and sets out on a road trip to find somewhere to settle down with Laura Dern, Dern's mother hires a whole bunch of crazy kooks and detectives and killers to try and stop him. So ever since I started this whole Nicolas Cage review thing, I've been looking forward to this movie in particular. Primarily because I just wanted to see what a collaboration between Nicolas Cage and David Lynch would look like. Cage's most interesting performances usually come from when he works with a really good director. Like the Coen brothers, Werner Herzog, and Spike Jones. And also I just really like David Lynch. Like Nicolas Cage, he's just a fascinating character of a person, and he seems like a really hard worker too, who loves his craft. And I've liked the handful of films I've seen of David Lynch's to a varying degree. Currently, I've only seen Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, Inland Empire, and Straight Story. And also that weird thing on Netflix with the monkey, whatever the hell that is. Inland Empire in particular is a movie that had a profound effect on me. I wouldn't even call it a movie I necessarily enjoyed or liked, but it was such a unique experience, and it made me question what a film even is. So Wild at Heart is a lot closer to Blue Velvet than it is to Inland Empire or Lost Highway or something like that. It's less experimental than those movies, and it tells a more cohesive, straightforward story relatively speaking, because at the same time it still has that classic Lynch surreal quality to it. David Lynch described Wild at Heart as a love story that barrels down a strange highway through the twisted modern world. And yeah, I get that. It's like a runaway criminal lover story, akin to, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, True Romance, Natural Born Killers. But it's set in this dreamlike world. Also, there's a bunch of Wizard of Oz references throughout, and I mean a lot of Wizard of Oz stuff. Every other scene is somebody talking about Toto or the Yellow Brick Road. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. I liked when Laura Dern said something like, Oh, when we make love, it's like you take me over that rainbow. But then there's parts where they literally show Diane Ladd's character dressed as the Wicked Witch right in a broom. So if I'm trying to figure out why all this Wizard of Oz stuff is in there, I feel like Dern's mother obviously represents the witch. This evil figure who's preventing Dorothy, who in this movie is Laura Dern, from getting where she truly belongs with Nicolas Cage. Although there is a point where Nicolas Cage sees a vision of Glinda the Good Witch who, who tells him what to do. So maybe Nicolas Cage is Dorothy, I don't know. And all that whimsical Wizard of Oz fairy tale stuff is mashed together with this dark, disturbing, gratuitous David Lynch stuff. So on to my man Nicolas Cage is Sailor Ripley, and he is great in this. When the movie started, I thought, oh, he's got a southern accent. But as it went along, I was like, no, nope, that's an Elvis accent. He talks like, oh, 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 thank you very much. And the good side is I knew your daddy, and I thought Clyde was a good old guy. You knew my daddy? Yes, I did. He even talks about, like, banana sandwiches and sings multiple Elvis songs in this movie, too. It's always a, a rare treat when Nicolas Cage, like, bursts into song or dance in the movie. And this movie delivers tenfold on that. Nicolas Cage busts out some, like, karate chop uh, dance moves, which I've never seen before outside of maybe Mac from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And the whole movie, like, teases and builds on the promise that Nicolas Cage might sing Love Me Tender by Elvis. And man, does it deliver on that promise in a fantastic end credit sequence. I found an interview with Nicolas Cage from 2005 where he was talking about his experience working on this film. And he said, It was David Lynch that made it clear to me. If you're not having fun, then the audience isn't going to have fun either. And you can definitely tell Nicolas Cage is having a blast here. And that quote, I think, is important for the shape of things to come, where, like, even in the worst films, you can tell Cage is having a blast. Cage's character, Sailor Ripley, fits that cool bad boy archetype that he's played a few times so far. But in movies like Valley Girl and Peggy Sue Got Married, you watch it and go, like, okay, I guess that's going to be a bad boy within the 80s context of this movie, but eh. But this is one of the legit coolest characters he's ever played. He has the sweet snakeskin jacket, which he multiple times uh, describes as being symbolic of his individuality. I ever tell you that this here jacket represents a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom? About 50,000 times. Which is very funny to me because David Lynch is somebody who famously doesn't like explaining what his movies mean. 
it seems to me that that's what that recurrent visual motif is about. And I know you hate saying what things mean in your films, but am I right in thinking that that's at least in the right area? No. <laughs> And the fact that he has this line where a character heavy-handedly explains the symbolism really does feel like a direct reference to how corny something like that can be. Because also, like, who talks like that? This is what this symbolizes. Unless you're doing one of these reviews. Yeah. Laura Dern is also a big part of this movie. And for a long time, I wasn't a big fan of Laura Dern, to be honest. I used to find her annoying in movies, and I made fun of the weird face she made when she cried in Blue Velvet. By the way, she makes a very similar face in this, too. But after watching her in Inland Empire, I saw her in a different light. I distinctly remember saying to my friend while I was watching it that, like, she is almost the female Nicolas Cage. The way her performances can be so raw and experimental. I mean, she's great in this. She's pretty sexy in it, and she's the heart of the movie, really. Because Cage and Dern do have legit really good chemistry. There's an undeniable magnetism, and you root for them as a couple. It's also a very sexual movie. Every other scene is the two of them about to bang or bang in or just finishing banging. Maybe there is a little bit too much sex in this film. It gets a little bit gratuitous. There's a couple of things with sexual assault in Laura Dern's character and abortions and stuff. Personally, I kind of could have done without that. Diane Ladd, who is Laura Dern's uh, mother in real life and in the movie, is essentially the villain of the film. And she's one of the few parts of this film that didn't fully work for me. I mean, Diane Ladd commits to the insanity of the role as much as everybody else. And she was actually nominated for an Oscar for this movie, which is very crazy if you've seen her in this film. It's just that her parts were a little bit cringe at times. Her trying to seduce Cage in another part where she's like rubbing lipstick all over herself. And also her motivations for wanting to kill Nicolas Cage didn't even really make sense once you find out all the twists and the revelations at the end. So in typical David Lynch fashion, this movie is packed with these crazy cartoonish side characters. There's a great part where uh, Laura Dern and Nicolas Cage are just sitting at a bar and some guy comes and sits next to him and he just starts quacking and talking about pigeons. Pigeons spread diseases. I'd mess up if I should see that. Then the scene changes and, you know, the movie continues. There's also a really weird part where uh, Laura Dern starts telling this story about her cousin Del, who believes that the spirit of Christmas is being destroyed by aliens that wear black gloves. And also he liked to put a cockroach up his anus. And also, fun fact, that guy is played by Back to the Future's Crispin Glover. And this marks the third Nicolas Cage Crispin Glover collaboration after the best of times and Racing with the Moon. There's also a weird guy that talks about his dog and there's like a trio of topless obese women for some reason. The whole movie's just full of these like exaggerated weirdos. And I really like that. I like it when a strange character just pops up for a moment in a movie is not really addressed, not really important. I think that adds to the world of it all. And also stuff like that happens in real life. You'll be waiting at the bus stop, some weirdo starts talking to you, he'll leave and that's just part of your day. But anyway, let's get to the best weirdo of the whole movie, Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe is rocking like slick back hair, pencil thin mustache, tiny little stubs for teeth. Willem Dafoe already looks a little bit scary even on a good day, but here he's terrifying and his character's a real piece of shit. Willem Dafoe's played a lot of villains in this time, but this is one of the best. It's a very memorable performance and it's one of the highlights of the whole film. And without spoiling it, the way he exits the film is very cool too. So overall, Wild at Heart is weird and wild and wacky and I really, really liked it. I think it was that right level of Lynch surrealism to me. Stuff like Lost Highway and Inland Empire is just a little bit too uh, abstract, I think. But Wild at Heart was that good level between like cartoonish and kind of grounded. Told a fairly easy to follow story, but was weird enough to keep you interested. Also, yeah, you've got a kick-ass Nicolas Cage performance. Turns out Lynch and Nicolas Cage do make for a great combo. I do hesitate to say I highly recommend it, because it's certainly not for everybody. I can see some people finding it too uncomfortable and too messy and just obnoxious, but I thought it was rad. If I'm rating the Nicolas Cage movies I've reviewed so far, I'd probably put it as like his second best uh, right under Raising Arizona. And by the way, those two movies would make a great double feature. I mean, Sailor Ripley is basically High McDonough, but with an Elvis voice. And Wild at Heart is just a trashier and sleazier Raising Arizona, really. So the next thing Nicolas Cage did was something called Industrial Symphony No. 1, The Dream of the Brokenhearted, which is a weird like 50 minute long concert art house production made by David Lynch. I watched a bit of it. The first two minutes have Laura Dern and Nicolas Cage. 
And they have the same accents they do in Wild at Heart, but they're not playing the same characters, I guess. And as far as I can tell, the other 48 minutes, it's just like weirdly edited concert footage. And also a part where like the little guy from Twin Peaks saws wood for a few minutes. I don't know, I turn off. Nicolas Cage is only in it for two minutes. I think a review of that deserves to be in a David Lynch completionist filmography thing, not a Nicolas Cage one. So I'm not making a separate video about that. And after that, Nicolas Cage was in a movie called Zandali. And that's what I'm reviewing next. So until then, guys, thanks for watching.